University, and I'd like to welcome you to our this evening's festivities. Uh, first, I would like to recognize several uh, people here who are uh, dignitaries with us this evening. The President of Park University, Mike Grogi, and Molly Grogi.
her way to Union headquarters specifically to inform authorities about who locally was a Confederate and who was armed. Union Army hospitals grew so dependent on black workers, particularly black women, that the U.S. government began to explicitly recognize reciprocal ob obligations to black women. About 124 women slaves at a time staffed the Union Army Hospital in Newport News, Virginia. In the city of Alexandria, Virginia, where I live, 90 women appeared at the payroll of contraband in a hospital right in the city, while 24 were employed at the hospital at Fairfax Seminary, just outside the city limits and on my daily running route. Um, indeed, so many black women nursed in Union Army hospitals that the War Department maintained a many volume register of black nurses labeled colored women under contract. Think about that. Women involved in a particular kind of legal arrangement with the United States government entitling them to a particular kind of legal right. Now we've known for quite a long time, uh, since the Freedmen and Southern Society Project was founded in 1976, in fact, uh, that black people who made their way to the Union Army contributed to the war effort in decisive ways. I'm not really telling us much new yet. But what we've not recognized is that the U.S. government felt any sense of obligation in return. Now, there are good reasons why we haven't realized that. Sometimes the U.S. government felt no sense of obligation in return. Many laborers went unpaid. Soldiers sometimes turned fugitives out of camp or abused those who stayed. And even the most assiduous black laborers or spies could find themselves abandoned to their fate if military necessity moved the army on. The most famous illustration of that latter case is probably of General William Sherman abandoning a train load of, uh, a train as in people on foot, of uh, former slaves at Ebenezer Creek in Georgia. But there are a lot of, sort of less famous examples as well. One in Lake Providence, Louisiana in March of 1863, when two or 300 former slaves loaded confiscated cotton on the Union boats, uh, thinking, as one sergeant noted, that we would bring them with us when we left. But instead, Union forces left them on the bank of the river, men, women, and children, nearly all crying. Partly in disappointment, but partly for fear of the retribution they would face for aiding Union forces. So my point is not that everybody who worked got fair treatment, 
When it did, it said the way to make good citizens of freedmen is to recognize black citizenship immediately. Now, for former slaves who spent time in contraband camps, the connection between civil war and black citizenship grew directly out of their own wartime experiences in those camps. Boston Blackwell was a slave who ran the Union forces in Arkansas in 1863. He drove teams for Union quartermasters while living in a pine bluff contraband camp. He never enlisted as a soldier. He always remained a laborer in the contraband camp. And yet he firmly believed that the war itself and the part that runaway slaves like him played in it turned the Constitution of the United States into something that made us citizens, it did. And that's a great story. And Boston Blackwell um, is sort of a, a nice triumphant guy, um, but we can't end with him because that very same Pine Bluff contraband camp that he identified as the birthplace of his citizenship was also the death site of so many black slave refugees that a white aid worker named David Todd confided to his brother, I seem less sensible to impressions, meaning I don't even know this anymore. When the Illinois minister arrived in the camp, he estimated that 800 slave refugees were crowded into unfinished cabins. Sometimes they had chimneys, often not. Sometimes they had floors, often not. The condition of such rags as the colored people have for bed clothes and garments left him speechless. The jarring contrast between Blackwell's triumphal experience with Tom's observation was not unique to this one Pine Bluff camp, that same network of Mississippi Valley contraband camps that had inspired John Eaton to write his long report and to come up with this four-point plan. That exact same network of camps poured by one aid worker into exclaiming if the ostensible object was to kill free people, nothing could be more effective than contraband camps in the Mississippi Valley. So what do we make of this contrast? Do the horrendous conditions mean that the camps were not really redefining citizenship after all? Or the description's just exaggerations? In reality, things weren't really that bad. Neither. The camps were sites of humanitarian crisis, and they were also the places where the meaning of citizenship got rewritten at the very same time. By being both of those things at once, contraband camps tell us not only where our national citizenship, our notion of national citizenship was born, they also tell us exactly what citizenship meant in the 19th century, including what its very hard limitations were. We can barely call these camps sites of humanitarian crisis. The people in 
may be the next book that you're working on, but consider that the Civil War did uh, blow apart slavery and introduce the concept of citizenship um, for the people who worked in the contraband camps. But then why did it take another hundred years <laughs> for uh, the black people to achieve citizenship, full citizenship? See, yeah, there is a question that none of us have done a very good job of answering. <laughs> Um, and I think one of the reasons why we haven't done a good job of answering it is because we have underestimated the possibilities present during and right after the war. In other words, we sort of assumed that, well, nothing changed because nothing ever could have changed. And what I, and I used to think that too, um, what 
explanation of why it didn't continue to improve well, because of that industrialization and the transportation in the north that didn't happen in the south. But in explain, the 1880s. Well, well explain, explain to me how that would close off. I, I'm not understand, I mean, I understand that the development happened, but I don't understand what about that would close off possibilities. Uh, additional job opportunities. Shouldn't that open things back up, though, not close them down? But if they were for whites that had those opportunities in the north, and you don't have those in the south for whites or blacks. Well, you got as much railroad in the south as you do in the whites. It was doing the north. So the railroad thing is off the question, um, off the table. I mean, um, I'm not talking about, I mean, the question, I don't think um, your question, or at least as I heard it, isn't so much why do former Confederates not um, sort of continue along this trajectory of expansion of rights? I don't think that's terribly hard to explain at all. They lost, <laughs> and they're not happy about it, and they weren't. Delighted about it to begin with. The bigger question, I really think, is why is it that these northern whites are willing to entertain notions that they wouldn't have before the war and then sort of seem to backtrack? And I just don't see how expanded opportunity in the north but not the south explains that. What you might be saying, what might be true, is well, they just get distracted, that there's a whole new host of problems that, that attend industrialization. And they get sort of sidetracked under those new problems. And that's possible. That's what people have sort of said insofar as they've answered the question, is that the post-war problems are just different. And people are tired of thinking about the South. And so they look to those questions instead. And that could well be part of it. But I still think we need more specifics than that. I, I think that there are probably some important milestones along the way. And I, I want to know more about what those milestones are. Um, it seems to me that perhaps this happened because of the horrors of war. Uh, the Civil War was horrible. I mean, there was brother against brother, and there was huge, massive uh, uh, killing, and, and there was mass hunger and deprivation and destruction and the Sherman's March, you know, to the time, you know, like this whole thing. But there were horrible circumstances. And, and the black people who were able to escape uh, the South uh, actually served a, a very important service to the Union soldiers to provide food when they could or, or feed bags or, or whatever else was provided. Um, and, and, and in a way, maybe, maybe their service was viewed, calling them citizens was in a way, uh, a way to recognize the service that they were doing because they certainly were 
or fighting the war that go beyond what you might uh, grow up with, right? For black and white soldiers, right? There's camaraderie, there's shared meaning, all that sort of thing. While the upper echelons may never embrace what you find in the trenches, right? I see what you mean. And in fact, during the war, I thought what I thought you were getting at is maybe white folks get worried about job competition and that kind of thing. And um, there's certainly some of that. That doesn't totally explain things for me in that um, in the post-war, in the exact time when we see things like uh, the uh, Supreme Court undercutting the 14th Amendment and stuff like that, we also see northern states actively sending agents to Europe to get uh, to, to immigration agents to get new immigrants because we need them for labor. So it can't be strictly a labor competition. There has to be an element of race and all the rest involved. But I see what you're saying, that uh, it might be that the general with his nice shoulder straps sits in his tent and he isn't in the trenches next to the white guy and the black guy who suddenly are thrown into the trenches together. And after the war, he's the guy who has more power. There could well be some, I, I sort of, that's the story, I secretly do suspect there's some of that going on, but I have no evidence for it yet, um, which is why I didn't propose it. But I suspect some of that is going on because it's kind of what's, and the reason why I think it might be is that during the war itself, enlisted Union soldiers start calling for an end to slavery before their senior officers do, and they explain that the reason is, because I'm here fighting it, and he has his crushy soldier staff, plus he gets paid more if he doesn't want it, and I do. So they see a distinction during the war itself. So I do suspect that there could be some of that following the war, but I don't have the hard evidence for it yet. But it's a, it's a line of inquiry that really needs exploring. Native Americans and it explicitly includes black people. 
was really actually more to the cats. But I think that might be what you're referring to. Uh, what was the population redistribution like after the war of both blacks and the male population? You mean how many died or where did people go? Where did people go? Yeah. Um, most former slaves do stay in the South, but some of my estimates are you know, tens of thousands relocate north. Um, some during the war itself, the Union Army in 1862 actually at government expense relocates some countrymen camp residents in northern communities. And then after the war, there's a huge exodus, for example, to Washington, D.C. Uh, because the federal government is a place where former slaves can get employment after the war. So there are a couple of streams of migration, and then internally, there's uh, sort of motion for a while because people hit the road and they look for family members. You know, all I remember about my mother, she was sold to Alabama 20 years ago, and I'm going to go find her. And so there, there's sort of unsettled years of people looking. Um, but when the dust settles, really most black people do stay in the South, if you still count, especially if you still have Washington, D.C. as the South. So there is not uh, as much sort of redistribution as you might expect. Well, thank you very much.